VHS short for video home system is a standard for consumer level analog video recording on tape cassettes. Developed by Victor Company of Japan JVC in the early 1970s, it was released in Japan on September 9, 1976 and in the United States on August 23, 1977. From the 1950s, magnetic tape video recording became a major contributor to the television industry, via the first commercialized video tape recorders VTRs. At that time, the devices were used only in expensive professional environments such as television studios and medical imaging fluoroscopy. In the 1970s, videotape entered home use, creating the home video industry and changing the economics of the television and movie businesses. The television industry viewed videocassette recorders VCRs as having the power to disrupt their business, while television users viewed the VCR as the means to take control of their hobby. In the 1970s and early 1980s, there was a format war in the home video industry. Two of the standards, VHS and Betamax, received the most media exposure. VHS eventually won the war, dominating 60% of the North American market by 1980 and emerging as the dominant home video format throughout the tape media period. Optical disc formats later began to offer better quality than analog consumer video tape such as VHS and SVHS. The earliest of these formats, Laserdisc, was not widely adopted. However, after the introduction of the DVD format in 1997, VHS's market share began to decline. By 2008, DVD had replaced VHS as the preferred low-end method of distribution. The last known company in the world to manufacture VHS equipment, Funai of Japan, ceased production in July 2016. Topic: History. Topic: Prior to VHS. After several attempts by other companies, the first commercially successful VTR, the Ampex VRX1000, was introduced in 1956 by Ampex Corporation. At a price of US 50,000 United States dollars in 1956, over $400,000 in 2016's inflation, and US 300 United States dollars, over $2,000 in 2016's inflation, for a 90-minute reel of tape, it was intended only for the professional market. Kenjiro Takayanagi, a television broadcasting pioneer then working for JVC as its vice president, saw the need for his company to produce VTRs for the Japan market, and at a more affordable price. In 1959, JVC developed a two-head video tape recorder, and by 1960 a color version for professional broadcasting. In 1964, JVC released the DV220, which would be the company's standard VTR until the mid-1970s. In 1969, JVC collaborated with Sony Corporation and Matsushita Electric Matsushita was then parent company of Panasonic and is now known by that name, also majority stockholder of JVC until 2008 in building a video recording standard for the Japanese consumer. The effort produced the u Modich format in 1971, which was the first format to become a unified standard. U Modich was successful in business and some broadcast applications such as electronic news gathering, but due to cost and limited recording time very few of the machines were sold for home use. Soon after, Sony and Matsushita broke away from the collaboration effort, in order to work on video recording formats of their own. Sony started working on Betamax, while Matsushita started working on VX. JVC released the County Route 6060 in 1975, based on the U Modich format. 
Sony and Matsushita also produced U Modich systems of their own. Topic: VHS development. In 1971, JVC engineers Yumashira Ishii and Shizuo Takano put together a team to develop a consumer-based VTR. By the end of 1971 they created an internal diagram titled, VHS Development Matrix, which established 12 objectives for JVC's new VTR. These included, the system must be compatible with any ordinary television set. Picture quality must be similar to a normal air broadcast. The tape must have at least a two-hour recording capacity. Tapes must be interchangeable between machines. The overall system should be versatile, meaning it can be scaled and expanded, such as connecting a video camera, or dub between two recorders. Recorders should be affordable, easy to operate and have low maintenance costs. Recorders must be capable of being produced in high volume, their parts must be interchangeable, and they must be easy to service. In early 1972, the commercial video recording industry in Japan took a financial hit. JVC cut its budgets and restructured its video division, shelving the VHS project. However, despite the lack of funding, Takano and Shiraishi continued to work on the project in secret. By 1973 the two engineers had produced a functional prototype. Topic. Competition with Betamax In 1974, the Japanese Ministry of International Trade and Industry MIDI, desiring to avoid consumer confusion, attempted to force the Japanese video industry to standardize on just one home video recording format. Later, Sony had a functional prototype of the Betamax format, and was very close to releasing a finished product. With this prototype, Sony persuaded the MIDI to adopt Betamax as the standard, and allow it to license the technology to other companies. JVC believed that an open standard, with the format shared among competitors without licensing the technology, was better for the consumer. To prevent the MIDI from adopting Betamax, JVC worked to convince other companies, in particular Matsushita, Japan's largest electronics manufacturer at the time, marketing its products under the national brand in most territories and the Panasonic brand in North America, and JVC's majority stockholder, to accept VHS, and thereby work against Sony and the MIDI. Matsushita agreed, primarily out of concern that Sony might become the leader in the field if its proprietary Betamax format was the only one allowed to be manufactured. Matsushita also regarded Betamax's one hour recording time limit as a disadvantage. Matsushita's backing of JVC persuaded Hitachi, Mitsubishi, and Sharp to back the VHS standard as well. Sony's release of its Betamax unit to the Japanese market in 1975 placed further pressure on the MIDI to side with the company. However, the collaboration of JVC and its partners was much stronger, and eventually led the MIDI to drop its push for an industry standard. JVC released the first VHS machines in Japan in late 1976, and in the United States in mid-1977. Sony's Betamax competed with VHS throughout the late 1970s and into the 1980s see Videotape Format War. Betamax's major advantages were its smaller cassette size, higher video quality, and earlier availability but its shorter recording time proved to be a major shortcoming. Originally, Beta the first machines using the NTSC television standard were able to record one hour of programming at their standard tape speed of 1.5 inches per second IPS. The first VHS machines could record for two hours, due to both a slightly slower tape speed 1.31 IPS, and significantly longer tape. 
Betamax's smaller sized cassette limited the size of the reel of tape, and could not compete with VHS's two hour capability by extending the tape length. Instead, Sony had to slow the tape down to 0.787 IPS beta the second in order to achieve two hours of recording in the same cassette size. This reduced Betamax's once superior video quality to worse than VHS when comparing two-hour recording. Sony eventually released an extended beta cassette, Beta the Third, which allowed NTSC Betamax to break the two-hour limit, but by then VHS had already won the format battle. Additionally, VHS had a far less complex tape transport mechanism than Betamax, and VHS machines were faster at rewinding and fast-forwarding than their Sony counterparts. Topic. Initial releases of VHS-based devices The first VCR to use VHS was the Victor HR3300, and was introduced by the president of JVC in Japan on September 9, 1976. JVC started selling the HR3300 in Akihabara, Tokyo, Japan on October 31, 1976. Region-specific versions of the JVC HR3300 were also distributed later on, such as the HR3300U in the United States, and HR3300EK in the United Kingdom in January 1977. The United States received its first VHS-based VCR, the RCA VBT-200 on August 23, 1977. The RCA unit was designed by Matsushita, and was the first VHS-based VCR manufactured by a company other than JVC. It was also capable of recording four hours in LP long play mode. The United Kingdom later received its first VHS-based VCR, the Victor HR3300EK in 1978. Quasar and General Electric would follow up with VHS-based VCRs, all designed by Matsushita. By 1999, Matsushita alone produced just over half of all Japanese VCRs. Topic. Technical details Topic. Cassette and tape design The VHS cassette is a 187 mm wide, 103 mm deep, 25 mm thick 7 3 4 1 16 1 inch plastic shell held together with five Phillips head screws. The flip-up cover that protects the tape has a built-in latch with a push-in toggle on the right side bottom view image. The VHS cassette also includes an anti-dispooling mechanism consisting of several plastic parts between the plastic spools, near the front of the tape white and black in the top view. The spool latches are released by a push-in lever within a 6.35 mm hole accessed from the bottom of the cassette, 19 mm inch inwards from the edge label. There is a clear tape leader at both ends of the tape to provide an optical auto stop for the VCR transport mechanism. A light source is inserted into the cassette through the circular hole in the center of the underside when loaded in the VCR, and two photodiodes are located to the left and right sides of where the tape exits the cassette. When the clear tape reaches one of these, enough light will pass through the tape to the photodiode to trigger the stop function. In more sophisticated machines it will start rewinding the cassette when the trailing end is detected. Early VCRs used an incandescent bulb as the light source, which regularly failed and caused the VCR to erroneously think that a cassette is loaded when empty, or would detect the blown bulb and stop functioning completely. Later designs use an infrared LED which had a much longer lifetime. 
The recording media is a 12.7 mm inch wide oxide coated mylar magnetic tape that is wound between two spools, allowing it to be slowly passed over the various playback and recording heads of the video cassette recorder. The tape speed for standard play mode see below is 3.335 cm per second 1.313 ips for ntsc 2.339 cm per second 0.921 ips for pal or just over 2.0 and 1.4 meters 6 feet 6.7 in and 4 feet 7.2 in per minute respectively the tape length for a T120 VHS cassette is 247.5 meters, 812 feet. Topic: Tape loading technique. As with almost all cassette-based videotape systems, VHS machines pull the tape out from the cassette shell and wrap it around the inclined head drum which rotates at 1,798.2 revolutions per minute in NTSC machines and at 1,500 revolutions per minute for PAL, one complete rotation of the head corresponding to one video frame. VHS uses an M loading system, also known as M-lacing, where the tape is drawn out by two threading posts and wrapped around more than 180 degrees of the head drum and also other tape transport components in a shape roughly approximating the letter M. Topic. Recording capacity A VHS cassette holds a maximum of about 430 meters (1410 feet) of tape at the lowest acceptable tape thickness, giving a maximum playing time of about 4 hours in a T240 DF480 for NTSC and 5 hours in an E300 for PAL at standard play SP quality. More frequently however, VHS tapes are thicker than the required minimum to avoid complications such as jams or tears in the tape. Other speeds include long play, LP, and extended play, EP, or super long play, SLP, standard on NTSC, rarely found on PAL machines. For NTSC, LP and EP, SLP doubles and triples the recording time accordingly, but these speed reductions cause a reduction in video quality, from the normal 250 lines in SP, to 230 analog lines horizontal in LP and even less in EP, SLP. The slower speeds cause a very noticeable reduction in linear non-hi-fi audio track quality as well, as the linear tape speed becomes much lower than what is commonly considered a satisfactory minimum for audio recording. Topic. Tape lengths Both NTSC and PAL, CCAM VHS cassettes are physically identical, although the signals recorded on the tape are incompatible. However, as tape speeds differ between NTSC and PAL, CCAM, the playing time for any given cassette will vary accordingly between the systems. In order to avoid confusion, manufacturers indicate the playing time in minutes that can be expected for the market the tape is sold in. It is perfectly possible to record and play back a blank TXXX tape in a PAL machine or a blank EXXX tape in an NTSC machine, but the resulting playing time will be different from that indicated. To calculate the playing time for a TXXX tape in a PAL machine, use this formula. PAL, CCAM recording time equals TXXX in minutes asterisk 1.426 to calculate the playing time for an EXXX tape in an NTSC machine, use this formula. NTSC recording time equals EXXX in minutes asterisk 0.701 
EXXX indicates playing time in minutes for PAL or CCAM in SP and LP speeds. TXXX indicates playing time in minutes for NTSC or PAL M in SP, LP, and EP, SLP speeds. SP is standard play, LP is long play, one half speed, equal to recording time in DVHS. HS mode, EP, SLP is extended, super long play, one third speed, which was primarily released into the NTSC market. Several other defined lengths of cassette entered mass production for both markets, but were either used only for professional duplication purposes, often pushing the limit of how much tape of a particular grade, thickness could fit into a standard cassette, in order to hold films that could not quite fit onto a shorter standard size without risking poor poor quality or reliability by switching to a thinner grade, or failed to find popularity amongst home consumers because of a glut of tape-length choices or poor value for money. EGT 130, 135 140th, T 168, E 150, E270, and more besides. Topic. Copy protection As VHS was designed to facilitate recording from various sources, including television broadcasts or other VCR units, content producers quickly found that home users were able to use the devices to copy videos from one tape to another. Despite the generation loss, this was regarded as a widespread problem, which the members of the Motion Picture Association of America MPAA claimed caused them great financial losses. In response, several companies developed technologies to protect copyrighted VHS tapes from casual duplication by home users. The most popular method was Macrovision, produced by a company of the same name. According to Macrovision, the technology is applied to over 550 million videocassettes annually and is used by every MPAA movie studio on some or all of their videocassette releases. Over 220 commercial duplication facilities around the world are equipped to supply Macrovision videocassette copy protection to rights owners. Also, the study found that over 30% of VCR households admit to having unauthorized copies, and that the total annual revenue loss due to copying is estimated at $370 million annually. The system was first used in copyrighted movies beginning with the 1984 film The Cotton Club. Macrovision copy protection saw refinement throughout its years, but has always worked by essentially introducing deliberate errors into a protected VHS tapes output video stream. These errors in the output video stream are ignored by most televisions, but will interfere with re recording of programming by a second VCR. The first version of Macrovision introduces high signal levels during the vertical blanking interval, which occurs between the video fields. These high levels confuse the automatic gain control circuit in most VHS VCRs, leading to varying brightness levels in an output video, but are ignored by the TV as they are out of the frame display period. Level 2. Macrovision uses a process called color stripping which inverts the analog signal's color burst period and causes off-color bands to appear in the picture. Level 3 protection added additional color stripping techniques to further degrade the image. These protection methods worked well to defeat analog to analog copying by VCRs of the time. Products capable of digital video recording are mandated by law to include features which detect macrovision encoding of input analog streams, and reject copying of the video. Both intentional and false positive detection of macrovision protection has frustrated archivists who wish to copy now fragile VHS tapes to a digital format for preservation. Topic. Recording process 
The recording process in VHS consists of the following steps, in this order. The tape is pulled from the supply reel by a capstan and pinch roller, similar to those used in audio tape recorders. The tape passes across the erase head, which wipes any existing recording from the tape. The tape is wrapped around the head drum, using a little more than 180 degrees of the drum. One of the heads on the spinning drum records one field of video onto the tape, in one diagonally oriented track. The tape passes across the audio and control head, which records the control track and the linear audio track or tracks. The tape is wound onto the take-up reel due to torque applied to the reel by the machine. Topic. Erase head The erase head is fed by a high-level, high-frequency AC signal that overwrites any previous recording on the tape. Without this step, the new recording cannot be guaranteed to completely replace any old recording that might have been on the tape. Topic. Video recording The tape path then carries the tape around the spinning head drum, wrapping it around a little more than 180 degrees called the Omega Transport System in a helical fashion, assisted by the slanted tape guides. The head rotates constantly at approximately 1,800 revolutions per minute in NTSC machines, exactly 1,500 in PAL, each complete rotation corresponding to one frame of video. Two tape heads are mounted on the cylindrical surface of the drum, 180 degrees apart from each other, so that the two heads take turns in recording. The rotation of the head drum, combined with the relatively slow movement of the tape, results in each head recording a track oriented at a diagonal with respect to the length of the tape. This is referred to as helical scan recording. To maximize the use of the tape, the video tracks are recorded very close together to each other. To reduce crosstalk between adjacent tracks on playback, an azimuth recording method is used, the gaps of the two heads are not aligned exactly with the track path. Instead, one head is angled at plus 7 degrees from the track, and the other at minus 7 degrees. This results, during playback, in destructive interference of the signal from the tracks on either side of the one being played. Each of the diagonal angled tracks is a complete TV picture field, lasting 1 60th of a second 1 50th on, PAL on the display. One tape head records an entire picture field. The adjacent track, recorded by the second tape head, is another 1 60th or 1 50th of a second TV picture field, and so on. Thus one complete head rotation records an entire NTSC or PAL frame of two fields. The original VHS specification had only two video heads. Later models implemented at least one more pair of heads, which were used at and optimized for the EP tape speed. In machines supporting VHS Hi-Fi, described later, yet another pair of heads was added to handle the VHS Hi-Fi signal. The high tape to head speed created by the rotating head results in a far higher bandwidth than could be practically achieved with a stationary head. VHS tapes have approximately 3 MHz of video bandwidth and 400 kHz of chroma bandwidth. The luminance black and white portion of the video is recorded as a frequency modulated, with a down converted color under chroma color signal recorded directly at the baseband. Each helical track contains a single field even or odd field, equivalent to half a frame encoded as an analog raster scan, similar to analog TV broadcasts. 
the horizontal resolution is 240 lines per picture height, or about 320 lines across a scan line, and the vertical resolution, the number of scan lines, is the same as the respective analog TV standard 576 for PAL or 486 for NTSC. Usually, somewhat fewer scan lines are actually visible due to overscan. In modern day digital terminology, NTSC VHS is roughly equivalent to 333 times 480 pixels Luma and 40 times 480 chroma resolutions. 333 times 480 pixels equals 159,840 pixels or 0.16 MP, one sixth of a megapixel, while PAL VHS offers the equivalent of about 335 times 500. 176 pixels luma and 40 times 240 chroma the vertical chroma resolution of pal is limited by the pal color delay line mechanism jvc would counter 1985 super beta with vhs hq or high quality the frequency modulation of the VHS luminance signal is limited to 3 MHz, which makes higher resolutions technically impossible even with the highest quality recording heads and tape materials, but an HQ-branded deck includes luminance noise reduction, chroma noise reduction, white clip extension, and improved sharpness circuitry. The effect was to increase the apparent horizontal resolution of a VHS recording from 240 to 250 analog equivalent to 333 pixels from left to right, in digital terminology. The major VHS OEMs resisted HQ due to cost concerns, eventually resulting in JVC reducing the requirements for the HQ brand to white clip extension plus one other improvement. In 1987, JVC introduced a new format called Super VHS, often known as SVHS, which extended the bandwidth to over 5 MHz, yielding 420 analog horizontal, 560 pixels left to right. Most Super VHS recorders can play back standard VHS tapes, but not vice versa. SVHS was designed for higher resolution, but failed to gain popularity outside Japan because of the high costs of the machines and tapes. Because of the limited user base, Super VHS was never picked up to any significant degree by manufacturers of pre-recorded tapes, although it was used extensively in the low-end professional market for filming and editing. Topic. Audio recording After leaving the head drum, the tape passes over the stationary audio and control head. This records a control track at the bottom edge of the tape, and one or two linear audio tracks along the top edge. Topic. Original linear audio system In the original VHS specification, audio was recorded as baseband in a single linear track, at the upper edge of the tape, similar to how an audio compact cassette operates. The recorded frequency range was dependent on the linear tape speed. For the VHS SP mode, which already uses a lower tape speed than the compact cassette, this resulted in a mediocre frequency response of roughly 100 Hz to 10 kHz for NTSC, frequency response for PAL VHS with its lower standard tape speed was somewhat worse. The signal-to-noise ratio, SNR, was an acceptable 42 dB. Both parameters degraded significantly with VHS's longer play modes, with EP, NTSC frequency response peaking at 4 kHz. Audio cannot be recorded on a VHS tape without recording a video signal, even in the audio dubbing mode. If there is no video signal to the VCR input, most VCRs will record black video as well as generate a control track while the audio is being recorded. 
Some early VCRs would record audio without a control track signal, but this was of little practical use since the absence of a control track signal meant that the linear tape speed was irregular during playback. More expensive decks offered stereo audio recording and playback. Linear stereo, as it was called, fit two independent channels in the same space as the original mono audio track. While this approach preserved acceptable backward compatibility with monooral audio heads, the splitting of the audio track degraded the signal's SNR to the point that audible tape hiss was objectionable at normal listening volume. To counteract tape hiss, DEX applied Dolby B noise reduction for recording and playback. Dolby B dynamically boosts the mid-frequency band of the audio program on the recorded medium, improving its signal strength relative to the tape's background noise floor, then attenuates the mid-band during playback. Dolby B is not a transparent process, and Dolby encoded program material will exhibit an unnatural mid-range emphasis when played on non-Dolby-capable VCRs. High-end consumer recorders took advantage of the linear nature of the audio track, as the audio track could be erased and recorded without disturbing the video portion of the recorded signal. Hence, audio dubbing and video dubbing where either the audio or video are re-recorded on tape without disturbing the other, were supported features on prosumer linear video editing decks. Without dubbing capability, an audio or video edit could not be done in place on master cassette, and requires the editing output be captured to another tape, incurring generational loss. Studio film releases began to emerge with linear stereo audio tracks in 1982. From that point onward nearly every home video release by Hollywood featured a Dolby encoded linear stereo audio track. However, linear stereo was never popular with equipment makers or consumers. Topic. Tracking adjustment and index marking Another linear control track, at the tape's lower edge, holds pulses that mark the beginning of every frame of video. These are used to fine-tune the tape speed during playback, so that the high-speed rotating heads remained exactly on their helical tracks rather than somewhere between two adjacent tracks known as tracking. Since good tracking depends on precise distances between the rotating drum and the fixed control, audio head reading the linear tracks, which usually varies by a couple of micrometers between machines due to manufacturing tolerances, most VCRs offer tracking adjustment, either manual or automatic, to correct such mismatches. The control track is also used to hold index marks, which were normally written at the beginning of each recording session, and can be found using the VCR's index search function. This will fast wind forward or backward to the end specified index mark, and resume playback from there. At times, higher-end VCRs provided functions for the user to manually add and remove these marks, so that, for example, they coincide with the actual start of the television program. But this feature later became hard to find. By the late 1990s, some high-end VCRs offered more sophisticated indexing. For example, Panasonic's tape library system assigned an ID number to each cassette, and logged recording information channel, date, time and optional program title entered by the user, both on the cassette and in the VCR's memory for up to 900 recordings 600 with titles. Topic. Hi-Fi audio system Around 1984, JVC added Hi-Fi Audio to VHS model HRD 725U in response to Betamax's introduction of Beta Hi-Fi. Both VHS Hi-Fi and Betamax Hi-Fi delivered flat full range frequency response, 20 Hz to 20 kHz, excellent 70 dB signal to noise ratio in consumer space, second only to the compact disc, dynamic range of 90 dB and 
professional audio grade channel separation more than 70 decibels. VHS hi-fi audio is achieved by using audio frequency modulation AFM, modulating the two stereo channels L, R, on two different frequency modulated carriers and embedding the combined modulated audio signal pair into the video signal. To avoid crosstalk and interference from the primary video carrier, VHS's implementation of AFM relied on a form of magnetic recording called depth multiplexing. The modulated audio carrier pair was placed in the hitherto unused frequency range between the luminance and the color carrier below 1.6 MHz, and recorded first. Subsequently, the video head erases and re-records the video signal combined luminance and color signal over the same tape surface, but the video signal's higher center frequency results in a shallower magnetization of the tape, allowing both the video and residual AFM audio signal to coexist on tape. PAL versions of Beta Hi-Fi use this same technique. During playback, VHS Hi-Fi recovers the depth recorded AFM signal by subtracting the audio head signal which contains the AFM signal contaminated by a weak image of the video signal from the video head signal which contains only the video signal, then demodulates the left and right audio channels from their respective frequency carriers. The end result of the complex process was audio of outstanding fidelity, which was uniformly solid across all tape speeds EP, LP or SP, since JVC had gone through the complexity of ensuring Hi-Fi's backward compatibility with non-Hi-Fi VCRs. Virtually all studio home video releases produced after this time contained Hi-Fi audio tracks, in addition to the linear audio track. Under normal circumstances, all Hi-Fi VHS VCRs will record Hi-Fi and linear audio simultaneously to ensure compatibility with VCRs without Hi-Fi playback, though only early high-end Hi-Fi machines provided linear stereo compatibility. Due to the path followed by the video and Hi-Fi audio heads being striped and discontinuous, unlike that of the linear audio track, Head switching is required to provide a continuous audio signal. While the video signal can easily hide the head switching point in the invisible vertical retrace section of the signal, so that the exact switching point is not very important, the same is obviously not possible with a continuous audio signal that has no inaudible sections. Hi-Fi audio is thus dependent on a much more exact alignment of the head switching point than is required for non-Hi-Fi VHS machines. Misalignments may lead to imperfect joining of the signal, resulting in low-pitched buzzing. The problem is known as head chatter and tends to increase as the audio heads wear down. The sound quality of hi-fi VHS stereo is comparable to the quality of CD audio, particularly when recordings were made on high-end or professional VHS machines that have a manual audio recording level control. This high quality compared to other consumer audio recording formats such as compact cassette attracted the attention of amateur and hobbyist recording artists. Home recording enthusiasts occasionally recorded high-quality stereo mixdowns and master recordings from MuddyTrack audio tape onto consumer-level hi-fi VCRs. However, because the VHS hi-fi recording process is intertwined with the VCR's video recording function, advanced editing functions such as audio-only or video-only dubbing are impossible. A short-lived alternative to the hi-fi feature for recording mixdowns of hobbyist audio-only projects was a PCM adapter so that high-bandwidth digital video could use a grid of black and white dots on an analog video carrier to give pro-grade digital sounds though DAT tapes made this obsolete. Some VHS decks also had a simulcast switch, allowing users to record an external audio input along with off-air pictures. 
Some televised concerts offered a stereo simulcast soundtrack on FM radio and as such, events like Live Aid were recorded by thousands of people with a full stereo soundtrack despite the fact that stereo TV broadcasts were some years off especially in regions that adopted NICAM. Other examples of this included network television shows such as Friday Night Videos and MTV for its first few years in existence. Likewise, some countries, most notably South Africa, provided alternate language audio tracks for TV programming through an FM radio simulcast. The considerable complexity and additional hardware limited VHS hi-fi to high-end decks for many years. While linear stereo all but disappeared from home VHS decks, it was not until the 1990s that hi-fi became a more common feature on VHS decks. Even then, most customers were unaware of its significance and merely enjoyed the better audio performance of the newer decks. Topic. Variations. Topic. Super VHS, ADOT, SVHS ET Several improved versions of VHS exist, most notably Super VHS, SVHS, an analog video standard with improved video bandwidth. SVHS improved the horizontal luminance resolution to 400 lines versus 250 for VHS, beta and 500 for DVD. The audio system both linear and AFM is the same. SVHS made little impact on the home market, but gained dominance in the camcorder market due to its superior picture quality. The ADAT format provides the ability to record muddy track digital audio using SVHS media. JVC also developed SVHS ET technology for its Super VHS camcorders and VCRs, which simply allows them to record Super VHS signals onto lower priced VHS tapes, albeit with a slight blurring of the image. Nearly all later Super VHS camcorders and VCRs have SVHS ET ability. Topic: VHS C, Super VHS C. Another variant is VHS Compact (VHSC), originally developed for portable VCRs in 1982, but ultimately finding success in palm-sized camcorders. The longest tape available for NTSC holds 60 minutes in SP mode and 180 minutes in EP mode. Since VHSC tapes are based on the same magnetic tape as full size tapes, they can be played back in standard VHS players using a mechanical adapter, without the need of any kind of signal conversion. The magnetic tape on VHSC cassettes is wound on one main spool and uses a gear wheel to advance the tape. The adapter is mechanical, although early examples were motorized, with a battery. It has an internal hub to engage with the VCR mechanism in the location of a normal full-size tape hub, driving the gearing on the VHS-C cassette. Also, when a VHS-C cassette is inserted into the adapter, a small swing arm pulls the tape out of the miniature cassette to span the standard tape path distance between the guide rollers of a full-size tape. This allows the tape from the miniature cassette to use the same loading mechanism as that from the standard cassette. Super VHS-C or SVHS Compact was developed by JVC in 1987. SVHS provided an improved luminance and chrominance quality, yet SVHS recorders were compatible with VHS tapes. Sony was unable to shrink its Betamax form any further, so instead developed Video 8, Hi 8, which was in direct competition with the VHS C, SVHS C format throughout the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Ultimately, neither format. One. 
and both have been superseded by digital high definition equipment. Topic: WVHS digital VHS high definition. WVHS allowed recording of Muse High Vision analog high definition television, which was broadcast in Japan from 1989 until 2007. The other improved standard, called Digital VHS (DVHS), records digital high definition video onto a VHS form factor tape. DVHS can record up to 4 hours of ATSC digital television in 720p or 1080i formats using the fastest record mode equivalent to VHS SP and up to 49 hours of lower definition video at slower speeds. Topic D9 There is also a JVC design component digital professional production format known as Digital S, or officially under the name D9, that uses a VHS form factor tape and essentially the same mechanical tape handling techniques as an SVHS recorder. This format is the least expensive format to support a cell sync pre read for video editing. This format competed with Sony's digital Betacam in the professional and broadcast market, although in that area Sony's Betacam family ruled supreme, in contrast to the outcome of the VHS, Betamax domestic format war. It has now been superseded by high-definition formats. <laughs> Topic. Accessories. Shortly after the introduction of the VHS format, VHS tape rewinders were developed. These devices served the sole purpose of rewinding VHS tapes. Proponents of the rewinders argued that the use of the rewind function on the standard VHS player would lead to wear and tear of the transport mechanism. The rewinder would rewind the tapes smoothly and also normally do so at a faster rate than the standard rewind function on VHS players. However some rewinder brands did have some frequent abrupt stops, which occasionally led to tape damage. Some devices were marketed which allowed a personal computer to use a VHS recorder as a data backup device. The most notable of these was Arvid, widely used in Russia and CIS states. Similar systems were manufactured in the United States by Corvus and Alpha Microsystems, and in the UK by Backer from Danmere Limited. Topic: Signal standards. VHS can record and play back all varieties of analog television signals in existence at the time VHS was devised. However, a machine must be designed to record a given standard. Typically, a VHS machine can only handle signals using the same standard as the country it was sold in. This is because some parameters of analog broadcast TV are not applicable to VHS recordings. The number of VHS tape recording format variations is smaller than the number of broadcast TV signal variations. For example, analog TVs and VHS machines except multi-standard devices are not interchangeable between the UK and Germany, but VHS tapes are. The following tape recording formats exist in conventional VHS listed in the form of standard, lines, frames. CCAM, 625-25, CCAM, French variety. MESECAM, 625-25, most other CCAM countries, notably the former Soviet Union and Middle East. NTSC, 525 30s most parts of Americas, Japan, South Korea. PAL, 525 30 i.e., PAL-M, Brazil. 
Pal, 625 25 most of Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, many parts of Asia such as China and India, some parts of South America such as Argentina, Uruguay and the Falklands, and Africa note that Pal, 625 25 VCRs allow playback of CCAM and MESECAM tapes with a monochrome picture, and vice versa, as the line standard is the same. Since the 1990s, dual and multi-standard VHS machines, able to handle a variety of VHS-supported video standards, became more common. For example, VHS machines sold in Australia and Europe could typically handle PAL, MESECAM for record and playback, and NTSC for playback only on suitable TVs. Dedicated multi-standard machines can usually handle all standards listed, and some high-end models could convert the content of a tape from one standard to another on the fly during playback by using a built-in standards converter. SVHS is only implemented as such in PAL, 625 25 and NTSC, 525 30 SVHS machines sold in CCAM markets record internally in PAL, and convert between PAL and CCAM during recording and playback. SVHS machines for the Brazilian market record in NTSC and convert between it and PAL-M. A small number of VHS decks are able to decode closed captions on video cassettes before sending the full signal to the set with the captions. A smaller number still are able, additionally, to record subtitles transmitted with world standard teletext signals on pre-digital services, simultaneously with the associated program. SVHS has a sufficient resolution to record teletext signals with relatively few errors. Topic. Logo The VHS logo was commissioned by JVC and introduced with the JVCHR3300 in 1976. It uses the Lee font, designed by Leo Weiss. Topic. Uses in marketing VHS was popular for long-form content, such as feature films or documentaries, as well as short play content, such as music videos, in-store videos, teaching videos, distribution of lectures and talks, and demonstrations. VHS instruction tapes were sometimes included with various products and services, including exercise equipment, kitchen appliances, and computer software. Topic. VHS versus Betamax VHS was the winner of a protracted and somewhat bitter format war during the late 1970s and early 1980s against Sony's Betamax format as well as other formats of the time. Betamax was widely perceived at the time as the better format, as the cassette was smaller in size, and Betamax offered slightly better video quality than VHS, it had lower video noise, less luma chroma crosstalk, and was marketed as providing pictures superior to those of VHS. However, the sticking point for both consumers and potential licensing partners of Betamax was the total recording time. To overcome the recording limitation, Beta the Second Speed two-hour mode, NTSC regions only was released in order to compete with VHS's two-hour SP mode, thereby reducing Betamax's horizontal resolution to 240 lines versus 250 lines. In turn, the extension of VHS to VHS HQ produced 250 lines versus 240 lines, so that overall a typical Betamax, VHS user could expect virtually identical resolution. Very high-end Betamax machines still supported recording in the Beta the First mode and some in an even higher resolution Beta as Beta the First Super High Band mode, but at a maximum single cassette run time of 140 with an L830 cassette. 
because Betamax was released more than a year before VHS, it held an early lead in the format war. However, by 1981, United States Betamax sales had dipped to only 25% of all sales. There was debate between experts over the cause of Betamax's loss. Some, including Sony's founder Akio Morita, say that it was due to Sony's licensing strategy with other manufacturers, which consistently kept the overall cost for a unit higher than a VHS unit, and that JVC allowed other manufacturers to produce VHS units license-free, thereby keeping costs lower. Others say that VHS had better marketing, since the much larger electronics companies at the time Matsushita, for example, supported VHS. Sony would make its first VHS players, recorders in 1988, although it continued to produce Betamax machines until 2002. Topic. Decline. The VHS VCR was a mainstay in television equipped American and European living rooms for more than 20 years from its introduction in 1977. The home television recording market, as well as the camcorder market, has since transitioned to digital recording on solid state memory cards. The introduction of the DVD format to American consumers in March 1997 triggered the market share decline of VHS, though 94.5 million Americans still owned VHS format VCRs in 2005, market share continued to drop. In the mid-2000s, several retail chains in the United States and Europe announced they would stop selling VHS equipment. In the U.S., no major brick-and-mortar retailers stock VHS home video releases, focusing only on DVD and Blu-ray media. Second-hand retail stores like Rasputin Music, Goodwill, and the Salvation Army sell used VHSs in bargains, and some public libraries giving away their weeded VHS collections for free or to second-hand retail stores due to they are being replaced by DVDs and Blu-rays. The last known company in the world to manufacture VHS equipment was Funai of Japan, who produced videotape recorder under the Sanyo brand in China and North America. Funai ceased production of VHS equipment in July 2016, citing falling sales and a shortage of components. Topic: Modern use. Despite the decline in both VHS players and programming on VHS machines, they are still owned in some households worldwide. Those who still use or hold on to VHS do so for a number of reasons, including nostalgic value, ease of use in recording, keeping personal videos or home movies, watching content currently exclusive to VHS, and collecting. Some expatriate communities in the United States also obtain video content from their native countries in VHS format. Although VHS has been discontinued in the United States, VHS recorders and blank tapes were still sold at stores in other developed countries prior to digital television transitions. As an acknowledgement of the continued use of VHS, Panasonic announced the world's first dual-deck VHS Blu-ray player in 2009. The last standalone JVC VHS-only unit was produced October 28, 2008. JVC, and other manufacturers, continued to make combination DVD plus VHS units even after the decline of VHS. A market for pre-recorded VHS tapes has continued, and some online retailers such as Amazon still sell new and used pre-recorded VHS cassettes of movies and television programs. None of the major Hollywood studios generally issue releases on VHS. The last major studio film to be released in the format in the United States, other than as part of special marketing promotions, was A History of Violence in 2006. 
In October 2008, Distribution Video Audio Inc., the last major American supplier of pre-recorded VHS tapes, shipped its final truckload of tapes to stores in America. However, there have been a few exceptions. For example, The House of the Devil was released on VHS in 2010 as an Amazon exclusive deal, in keeping with the film's intent to mimic 1980s horror films. The horror film VHS2 was released as a combo in North America that included a VHS tape in addition to a Blu-ray and a DVD copy on September 24, 2013. Topic: Successors. Topic: VCD The Video CD VCD was created in 1993, becoming an alternative medium for video, in a CD-sized disc. Though occasionally showing compression artifacts and color banding that are common discrepancies in digital media, the durability and longevity of a VCD depends on the production quality of the disc, and its handling. The data stored digitally on a VCD theoretically does not degrade in the analog sense like tape. In the disc player, there is no physical contact made with either the data or label sides. When handled properly, a VCD will last a long time. Since a VCD can only hold 74 minutes of video, a movie exceeding that mark has to be divided into two or more discs. Topic. DVD The DVD video format was introduced first on November 1, 1996 in Japan to the United States on March 26, 1997 test marketed and mid-late 1998 in Europe and Australia. Despite DVD's better quality, typical horizontal resolution of 480 versus 250 lines per picture height, and the availability of standalone DVD recorders, VHS is still used in home recording of video content. The commercial success of DVD recording and rewriting has been hindered by a number of factors, including a reputation for being temperamental and unreliable, as well as the risk of scratches and hairline cracks. Incompatibilities in playing discs recorded on a different manufacturer's machines to that of the original recording machine. Compression artifacts, MPEG-2 video compression can result in visible artifacts such as macroblocking, mosquito noise and ringing which become accentuated in extended recording modes more than three hours on a DVD-5 disc. Standard VHS will not suffer from any of these problems, all of which are characteristic of certain digital video compression systems see discrete cosine transform, but VHS will result in reduced luminance and chroma resolution, which makes the picture look horizontally blurred resolution decreases further with LP and EP recording modes. VHS also adds considerable noise to both the luminance and chroma channels. High-capacity digital recording technologies High-capacity digital recording systems are also gaining in popularity with home users. These types of systems come in several form factors. Hard disk-based set-top boxes Hard disk-optical disk combination set-top boxes Personal Computer Based Media Center Portable Media Players with TV Out Capability Hard Disk Based Systems include TiVo as well as other Digital Video Recorder DVR offerings. These types of systems provide users with a no-maintenance solution for capturing video content. Customers of subscriber-based TV generally receive electronic program guides, enabling one-touch setup of a recording schedule. 
Hard disk based systems allow for many hours of recording without user maintenance. For example, a 120 gigabyte system recording at an extended recording rate XP of 10 megabits per second MPEG-2 can record over 25 hours of video content. Topic: Legacy Often considered an important medium of film history, the influence of VHS on art and cinema was highlighted in a retrospective staged at the Museum of Arts and Design in 2013. In 2015, the Yale University Library collected nearly 3,000 horror and exploitation movies on VHS tapes, distributed from 1978 to 1985, calling them the cultural id of an era. The 2013 documentary film Rewind This, directed by Josh Johnson, tracks the impact of VHS on film industry through various filmmakers and collectors. <laughs>